What is up guys, Dr. Gooden here, and in this video we will be talking about Newton's laws. All right, let's dive right in. Now, if you've been following along with this biomechanics series, you know that forces are important for human motion to occur. But it's through these three laws, and then a fourth law, the law of gravitation, that Newton originally described how forces and motion are intertwined. So let's take a look. The first law is the law of inertia. And in the original words, it states that every body perseveres in its state of rest or of uniform motion in a straight line, unless it is compelled to change that state by forces impressed upon it. So what does that mean in plain terms? Really what it means is that uh, the motion of a system or the rest of the system will continue indefinitely unless there is an unbalanced net force that acts upon it. Okay, so perhaps you have a a, an object hurtling through space. Maybe it's an asteroid, maybe it's a comet, comet. maybe it is uh, some alien space craft that is just going through space from a prior force that acted upon it to accelerate it up to a constant velocity and now it's just cruising. There are no other forces that will be acting on this um, object unless it comes into contact with the gravitational field of another planet. Remember gravity is a field force so it's a force that can exert changes to a system from afar, um, unless it comes into contact with a planet and its gravity, it will just continue in a straight line, just constantly. There's no air resistance, there's no friction, nothing else. Now on Earth, if we rolled a ball on flat land, uh, it would eventually slow down because of air resistance and friction. Even if we rolled a curling stone on ice, it would eventually slow down as well because even though there's almost no friction on ice, there's still some, and so eventually it'll slow down, and that's part of the sport of curling, is to land those stones in the house um, and knock the other ones out. I'm not even sure if they're called stones. Maybe they're called something else. So if you're from Canada, forgive me. And a body at rest, or a system at rest, will stay at rest, unless an unbalanced force, force acts upon it. So this iPad right here will be resting on the table, even though gravity's acting on it, and the normal force of the table is pushing up on it, um, but those are balanced forces. And until they become unbalanced, like if my muscles exert force and lift it up, then it will start to move. But if, if the forces are all balanced and nothing changes, it will stay at rest, okay? So that's the first law. The second law now is the law of acceleration. So that first law described really what happens in the state of constant motion or constant rest. And then if, an, if a force acts on the system, then we get into Newton's second law, the law of acceleration. So it states that the alteration of motion is ever proportional to the motive force, that just means the unbalanced or the extra external force, um, impressed and is made in the direction of the right line, straight line, in which that force is impressed. Okay, again, what is that sounds kind of confusing, so what does that mean? It just means that the change in motion is proportional to the magnitude of the applied force, and it's in the same direction as that applied force. So if we consider a ball on flat ground again, let's say it's a soccer ball on a field, and if I give that ball a small kick, not a very forceful kick, I'm not imparting very much force into that ball, and so it won't roll very far, because Newton's second law says that the alteration of motion is proportional to the motive force, and so my motive force, the kick, is of small magnitude, and so the ball will travel not very far. Now if I give that ball a big whopping kick to try to clear it from the backfield up into the midfield, now that's a lot more force, and that ball will travel a lot farther. So the ball will accelerate to a greater or lesser extent depending upon the amount of force that I put into that ball, and it will travel in the direction of the resultant vector of, this, of all of the forces that are acting upon it. So let's say that I'm kicking that ball at the same time that you know an attacking forward comes up and tries to kick the ball. Both of our feet collide with the ball in the center. Whoever was delivering more force to that ball, the ball will tra probably travel, maybe squeeze out between both of our feet, in a resultant direction more in line with whoever was kicking harder. Um, or in another example, maybe you have two cars, and this is kind of an unfortunate example, but maybe you have two cars and they hit each other at the intersection, <clears throat> and one car t-bones the other. Um, 
well, this car was traveling this way and this one was traveling this way. And when they impact, both cars will probably move in a resultant vector that way. So to sum up the second law, the change in motion of a system is dependent upon the magnitude and the direction of the force applied. Now the third law is the law of action and reaction. And it states, to every action there is always opposed and equal reaction, or the mutual actions of two bodies upon each other are always equal and directed to contrary parts. Now this one in my opinion is the most confusing of all as far as the wording goes, but really just means that forces exist in pairs. So one force acts on two objects. Now this can be misinterpreted. Every action force is met with an equal and opposite reaction force. That's true. But every action does not produce an equal and opposite reaction because of law two. So what am I saying? Imagine that I'm jumping, right? I'm doing a vertical jump. And as I allow gravity to build up momentum uh, during the unweighting phase of the jump and I'm descending and then I go through that breaking phase and the propulsive phase of the jump and then I eventually jump and leave the earth for I don't know uh, about 30 inches of height or maybe 31 if it's a good day I'm creating I'm using forces to now create an action in my body but is the earth going to travel an equal distance the other way so like when I jump is it actually pushing the earth away not quite. The Earth is so massive that it's not going to alter its course through space because I jumped. But there is an opposite and equal ground reaction force when I am putting force into the ground with my legs. Okay? And now finally, the law of gravitation or the law of attraction. Now, this just states that every body in the universe attracts every other body with a force directed along the line of centers for the, this would be center of mass, along the line of centers for the two objects that is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the separation between the two objects. So this is just explaining that there's gravity. Okay, and that's, for now that's all we need to know. But let's take a look at how these laws come into play with a vertical jump. Okay, so here we have Newton's laws, and we talked about the law of inertia, the law of acceleration, the law of action-reaction, and the law of gravitation. But we want to know how do these play out in a real-life scenario. So what I have here is what's called a force time curve. And if you haven't seen one before, we can generate this force time curve using a force platform. And now this one specifically was generated by a set of force plates from the company Hawken Dynamics which we use in our lab uh, to test our athletes specifically because they're great, they're mobile, they're wireless, they have Bluetooth connectivity, they stream straight to your smartphone. You don't need to have them hardwired. Um, we can take them to the track, we can take them to the weight room. It's really great. And so right now while I'm in quarantine and I can't get into the lab, I got permission to use these images from their uh, website and YouTube, so that was great. So to help us orient ourselves to this picture. Let's consider what's on the x and what's on the y axis. So on the x axis we have time. You can see that the seconds going across the bottom but I'll just write it. We have time going this way. And on the y axis we have newtons. And newtons remember are a measure of force. So I'm just going to actually write force going up on the y axis. Okay so it's a force time curve. We see force measured in newtons and time measured in seconds. And it looks like over time we have this sort of waveform. And so we see that force starts off at about 1,000 newtons, and we'll figure out what that means here in a second. And then it decreases and goes down to almost zero before increasing again, going well over 1,000. Um, and then after that peak, it drops back down to zero for a period of time, right here at about 2.6 seconds. It stays at zero, and then there's a big spike, and it comes up here to the peak right there, before eventually leveling off, coming back down the peak and then leveling off back at a thousand right over here. Okay, so what does this look like? Well, this beginning phase, and I've drawn out a little stick figure for us without arms, he's just a head and a torso and some legs. And I've marked his hip and knee and ankle joints. So this, this little guy here, he's standing still 
And as he's standing still, this is called the quiet phase. Phase. So the force platform is measuring the, the weight of this individual as he or she is standing on the force plates. And this is called the quiet phase. There's no change in force and therefore no change in the movement of the system. The system is staying at rest. Okay, And so we might say that this corresponds with Newton's first law, the law of inertia. And it's not until this individual begins to exert force uh, using his or her muscles that the system will change. Okay, so here in the second phase, we might call that the unweighting phase. In the unweighting phase, the individual is allowing the Earth's gravity to pull him or her closer to the Earth and develop momentum. Okay, so in the jump, this is called the unweighting phase, and what, what uh, we're demonstrating again is Newton's first law, the law of inertia. We allowed gravity to become an unbalanced force by removing the normal force that the legs were providing. By allowing the body to bend down into a squat, we're allowing motion to occur. So after the unweighting phase, we have the breaking phase. And now the breaking phase is when that individual starts to eccentrically control the downward motion using their quadriceps or glutes or hamstrings, their gastrocnemius, um, and slow down the rate of descent. Because they're applying force to the ground now, the rate of descent will slow. It's a deceleration of that motion. Okay, and so we see that people who can do this faster, people who are really snappy and quick and reactive, they're able to apply force more quickly and greater force at that. And because we know, due to Newton's second law, that the movement or acceleration of a system is directly proportional to the motive force, then we know that those who can apply force faster and a greater force, we know that they will break during that braking phase much faster, which leads into a better propulsive phase, what's shown in that teal color under the curve. And in the propulsive phase, we've reversed the motion and now the body is heading up into the atmosphere, so to speak, right? Trying to jump as high as you can. And the more force that you can produce during the propulsive phase and the faster, again, the higher that you're going to jump. Because if you impart a greater motive force, then the acceleration of the system, your body will be greater. So if you can produce more force in the ground during that propulsive phase and do it quicker, then you will have a greater force, a greater reactive force pushing you up into the air into your flight phase or your aerial phase. And that time that you spend in the air, we, we call flight time, the time that you're in the air. And then we can you know, integrate that and calculate your jump height. And that's how the force plates tell us immediately uh, how high our athlete or, or our person is jumping that we're testing. And, and this corresponds to Newton's third law, the law of action-reaction. So there's an action putting that um, force into the ground, and then there is a ground reaction force that is going back up into your body that's now propelling you into the air because you produce that first force with your legs into the ground. Because the earth is so massive, it's not pushing the earth away, remember, but it's your body compared to the earth is much smaller, and so it's going to push your body away up into the air. And so we have a distance here between you and the ground. We'll call that jump height. Okay, and the next phase of the jump is when you land. So you come back down, hopefully you don't land flat-footed like I drew this individual in the landing phase. Let's call this landing phase. Where there are high impact forces. If you land softly, if you try to land like a ninja or like a cat, you land quietly, then you can reduce those forces. And oftentimes we want to teach athletes how to land appropriately so they don't experience a huge shock of forces up through their bony structure and connective tissue, and that can lead to injury. Um, but there's also something to be said about being able to produce and handle high forces, and the body does adapt to that. Now the next phase we call the stabilization phase, and this is where you are absorbing that force before you stand up straight again. So the stabilization phase occurs, and that's why we see this wave-like pattern in the force time curve. Okay, and so those are all of the phases of a counter-movement vertical jump. And I say counter-movement because it begins with that initial development of momentum during the unweighting phase. 
So where does the universal law of gravitation fit in? Well, gravity is the whole reason why we jump. We jump so that we can try to leave the Earth's pole, if only for a second. And so gravity is holding us to the ground. Gravity is helping us develop momentum during the unweighting and the braking phase. And during the propulsive phase, we are producing an overcoming force to try to overcome gravity's pull, if only for a second. And the more force we produce, the greater the reaction force that sends us into the air, but eventually gravity will bring us back down. And we come down and we land during that landing and stabilization phase. So I hope that video was helpful to you guys and explained Newton's three laws and his fourth law in a way that made sense, okay? In a way that applies directly to what you are studying in kinesiology, in coaching, in strength and conditioning, in biomechanics. Now, the next video will be about Newton's first law. It will be a deeper dive into it with more examples. So check that out if you wanna keep learning or check out the playlist to visit any other biomechanics videos. As always, I'm Dr. Gooden. I'm happy to answer your questions in the comments. Thanks for checking out this video.